Alaskan cold has a way of seeping into your bones out here. It's not the kind of cold you shake off by a fire or with a stiff drink. No, this is the kind of cold that burrows deep, anchoring itself in your soul, making you wonder if you'll ever be warm again. We'd been working on the Trans, Alaska Pipeline for months. It was grueling work, but the pay was good, and most of us had grown used to the relentless snow and isolation. You learn to keep your head down, focus on the job, and not think too much about the miles of icy wilderness stretching out in every direction. We were miles from the nearest town, surrounded by nothing but snow, ice, and the occasional howl of the wind. I remember the day the drifter showed up like it was yesterday. He came out of nowhere, stumbling into our camp as if he'd been wandering for days. The guy looked half-crazed, wild hair sticking out from under a ragged beanie, eyes darting around like he was being chased by something only he could see. Listen, he rasped, his voice raw with desperation. You need to get out of here. There's something in the woods, something that's been here long before you lot started digging up the earth. It hunts at night, moves without a sound, and you'll never see it coming until it's too late. We all exchanged looks, some of the guys smirking at each other. Old Jack, the foreman, stepped forward, arms crossed over his broad chest. What are you talking about, old man? The only thing out here is snow and maybe the odd wolf. If you're looking for a handout, you've come to the wrong place. But the drifter wasn't deterred. He shook his head. Eyes wide with fear. I'm telling you, it's real. I've seen it. It's huge, bigger than any man. And it walks on two legs. It's been following me for days, staying just out of sight. But I can feel it watching me, watching all of us. By then, most of the crew had lost interest. The guy sounded like he'd been out in the cold too long. Maybe frostbitten in his brain. Jack waved him off, and we all went back to our work. But something about the drifter's words stuck with me. I couldn't shake the feeling that he believed what he was saying, that he'd seen something out there in the dark. A few nights later, Steve went missing. It was just after our shift ended, and we were all bunking down for the night. The wind was howling outside, making the walls of the tent shudder. Steve had said he was going out to take a leap, but when he didn't come back, we started to worry. We searched the camp, called out his name but there was no sign of him. It was like he'd vanished into thin air. Jack tried to keep everyone calm, said Steve, probably got turned around in the dark and would find his way back by morning. But morning came and still no Steve. We found his tracks leading away from the camp. But they ended abruptly, like he'd been plucked right off the ground. No blood, no signs of a struggle, just gone. That's when the fear really set in. We tried to keep working, tried to convince ourselves that Steve would turn up, but everyone was on edge. At night, I could feel eyes on me, like something was watching from the darkness just beyond the firelight. I'd catch glimpses of movement out of the corner of my eye, a tall, shadowy figure that would disappear the moment I turned to look. A week passed, and the tension was thick enough to cut with a knife. Then it happened again. This time, it was dough. One moment he was there, the next he wasn't. His boots were still by his bedroll, and his coat hung on a hook by the tent flap. But Doe himself had vanished without a trace. By now, everyone was on the brink of panic. The drifter's warning echoed in my head. It hunts at night, moves without a sound. Whatever it was, it was real, and it was picking us off one by one. We decided to stick together, take shifts keeping watch. But it didn't matter. Whatever was out there, it was too smart, too fast. It never left tracks. Never made a sound. The snow wasn't the only thing that covered tracks out here. This thing was a ghost in the night, and we were just prey. One night I finally saw it. We were huddled around the fire trying to stay awake when I caught a glimpse of something huge moving just beyond the light. My heart pounded in my chest as I stared into the darkness, and then I saw it big, hairy, with arms and legs like tree trunk. It was a massive creature, easily twice the size of any man, with eyes that glowed faintly in the firelight. Bigfoot. It had to be. It was gone in an instant, 
disappearing into the night with that eerie silence. But I knew what I'd seen. The others saw it too. Any doubts they'd had were shattered. We decided to leave the next morning, abandoning our posts and equipment. The pipeline wasn't worth our lives, but Bigfoot had other plans. As we packed up, I could feel a tension in the air, like a storm about to break. We were halfway to the trucks when we heard it, a low growl that sent a shiver down my spine. We turned to see the creature standing there not twenty yards away, watching us with those glowing eyes. For a moment, none of us moved. Then Jack, always the fearless leader, raised his rifle and fired. The shot rang out, echoing through the trees, but the creature didn't even flinch. It let out a roar that shook the ground beneath our feet and charged. We scattered, running for our lives, but the creature was faster. It tore through our camp, ripping tents and equipment to shreds. But somehow it didn't kill us. It was as if it was sending a message. This was its territory, and we weren't welcome. I don't know how long I ran, but when I finally stopped gasping for breath, the creature was gone. The others were nowhere to be seen. I was alone, miles from camp, and the only sound was the wind howling through the trees. I never saw this Bigfoot-like creature again after that night, and no, it was not an animal. It was some bipedal cryptid. The stories on here are great. I have one to share, although probably not one of the better ones. Me and this girl, both around the age of 22, were out on the town for some drinks and dancing with other friends. We all worked together, and she rode with me to meet everyone else at this club. Fast forward, it's the end of the night. My grandmother at the time, rest her soul, lived in a semi-secluded area, decent yard, Wooded hill surrounding the back and across the street, you could climb down and go to this creek and go swimming. On one end it was shallow, the other end was deeper. It's like 1 a.m. in the morning at this point. Being the hopeless romantic I am, I took this girl there to swim, hoping to skinny dip. We climbed down the embankment, probably like a 15-foot climb down. We head over to the deeper end while walking from the shallow end. We're kind of just sitting in the water with our feet in, kissing and stuff. Things start to get heated, and I take my shirt off and jump in about shoulder, deep water. She's still sitting on the edge of like this ledge before you get into the deep water. I get in between her legs, and we start making out some more. She starts to take her shirt off while I'm in the water, and she's on the ledge of this rock while sitting in the water. Now the moon is out, and it's kind of lit up along the creek bed. All of a sudden, we hear what is like huffing and grunting and sticks and brush moving around. I thought maybe one of my uncles were awake and came over to the edge of the climb down to see what all the noise was, even though we weren't being noisy. At least I didn't think so. I called out to... To the area where the noise was and nothing... We couldn't see what it was, and this wasn't noises coming from a deer. It starts to get more aggressive, as if it's getting closer and approaching faster. I get the hell out of the water, and we start walking fast or running when we could to where we have to climb back up. As we're running, we can hear. Whatever it was make its way into the water and cross over to our side that we have to climb up on. I'm telling her to hurry the F up and climb as I'm pushing her up the embankment. She gets up and gives me her hand to help me up. I get man and I swear. Whatever it was was right behind me climbing up too. We sprint over to my grandma's house across the street and luckily her door was open. Back about 20 years ago, this wasn't all that uncommon. We get inside and I close the door locking it. I look outside the curtains and nothing is out there. I can't quite remember, but I'm pretty sure everyone was asleep in the house. I got us some towels to dry up with and waited for about 30 minutes and got in the car and left. It was crazy. I got chills just remembering about this. I live very close to the forest. I have to pass only two houses until the first trees grow. This is where I go when I'm feeling bad for any reason. 
So one afternoon, I'd just left my home and almost ran into the forest. I just randomly walked around without any clue of where I was going. At one point, I stumbled and fell. At this point, I was just done, so I just turned. So I would lay on my back and stared up in the sky. Stayed there for quite a while without moving. After it had been dark for quite a while, I heard a crack like someone stepping on a branch. This was when I noticed that I, a young defenseless woman, was laying on the ground completely alone somewhere in the middle of the woods, and that nobody would be here or help me of it. I got in any trouble, so I got scared and stood up as soon as I could. Now remember, I have been quite distressed when I came there, so I didn't look at what was around me at all. And while I was laying around, all I looked at was the sky, so I had absolutely no idea where I was. So the first thing I saw was some sort of cage, and there were other weird shapes that I could see. And then I heard another noise, so I was sure someone was walking around near me. I freaked out and tried running for it which was quite hard, as it was in the middle of the night. But the moon was shining bright, so I actually managed to not get hurt. I ran around, eventually found a way, followed it, and ended up near a chapel on a hill. I recognized it and therefore was able to find my way back home. I arrived there at about 1 a.m. I was incredibly exhausted, but also pretty scared, as you don't come across cages in the middle of the woods in a daily base. And so how my mind made the connection. Hiding human in cage, extreme danger. So I locked everything. I was so creeped out. I was really paranoid for weeks, but nothing more happened. I eventually overheard some classmates talk about an abandoned zoo nearby that they were going to look for. Googled it, and there apparently still are some cages. Looks like I figured out where I had been and probably got scared by some deer. I actually might go search for that place during daytime. I mean, it sounds pretty interesting. September 18. The river monster, which has been sighted at numerous locations upstream, causing great alarm and preying on horses and cattle crossing the river, has undoubtedly arrived in our vicinity, sparking considerable excitement. This morning, around eight o'clock, while the ferry boat, carrying two wagons and three horsemen, was traversing to the eastern shore, a sudden and violent shaking of the boat occurred. The jolt was so abrupt that one man seated on the gunwale was thrown into the water. Fortunately, he managed to grasp the side of the boat and was pulled back in, albeit thoroughly soaked. The initial shake was akin to an earthquake, while the second lifted the boat clear from the water, nearly capsizing it. The horses struggled to maintain their footing. The river surged as if caught in a whirlpool, with waves reaching two feet high and crashing across the boat. Simultaneously, the occupants witnessed forty feet away an immense object slicing through the water with immense force. It was undoubtedly the pelican, beaked head of the monstrous creature, its powerful tail causing the violent rocking of the boat. The creature expelled a jet of water ten feet high, its roar audible from the shore, before vanishing beneath the surface. This account, provided by those aboard the boat, instilled great fear yet they managed to row ashore safely. Upon sharing their story, it stirred a sensation among the villagers, prompting fifty to a hundred men to venture down the river in hopes of catching a glimpse of the colossal reptile. The community is abuzz with discussion, and there is talk of organizing an expedition to monitor the river and confront the monster. Among the passengers on the boat were W. Ferris and his wife, George Smith, B.W., Williams and Henry Hoffmeyer, the latter a traveling agent for a reputable St. Louis firm, and the others are esteemed individuals known for their honesty. As you may be aware, this region of Missouri, Tennessee, and the Mississippi River has a history of seismic activity, often altering the river's course. The Muscogee people attributed such occurrences to the Thai snake, a mythical river god believed to dwell beneath the earth. Reports of monsters in the Mississippi have persisted for centuries, 
often attributed to large paddlefish, massive catfish, or even giant alligators migrating upstream. Additionally, bull sharks from the Gulf of Mexico have been known to venture into the river, reaching as far north as Illinois. A friend and I found ourselves being stalked by a mountain lion during a camping trip at a Christian camp behind my house. We had spent the day hanging out in the conference center and had to walk back to our campsite at night. Although I was familiar with the hiking trails from growing up in the area, the darkness enveloped us, and we had only a lighter for illumination. As we were about 200 yards from our tent, I began to notice the subtle rustling of leaves behind us. Initially, I dismissed it as a bird hopping around in the underbrush. However, as we continued down the trail, the rustling escalated into loud pouncing sounds, and whatever was making them ascended onto a ledge above us. The sudden noise startled us, prompting my friend to ignite the lighter to investigate. What we saw in the flickering light left us both stunned, two unmistakable cat eyes glimmering back at us. In that brief moment, we both realized a mountain lion was lurking just yards away. Instinctively, I grabbed my friend to prevent him from bolting and instructed him to retrieve his knife. We both drew our knives, attempting to maintain composure as we proceeded along the trail for the remaining 100 yards. The sound of the mountain lion's steps echoed ominously behind us, mere feet away. When we finally reached the tent, we made a dash for safety, scrambling to find the battery-powered lantern. From the shelter of the tent, we observed the mountain lion circling us for about ten minutes. Strangely, it didn't exhibit signs of aggression. Instead, it seemed more curious than anything else. Unfazed by our presence, it even took a moment to groom itself, nonchalantly licking its paw. We refrained from making any sudden movements or loud noises, not wanting to provoke it further. Eventually, the mountain lion wandered off, and we breathed a sigh of relief. However, the image of those piercing eyes illuminated by the flame of the lighter against the dark forest backdrop remains etched in my memory, a reminder of the wild and unpredictable nature of the wilderness. I was spearfishing at night with a pretty powerful flashlight when out of the dark came this foot-long snake-looking thing. Almost gave me a heart attack. Turned out to be a ragworm swimming towards my face. A couple of minutes later, another one came swimming at me. Ten minutes later, the water was full of these long suckers all around me in the dark. Creeped me out. Turned out it was mating season, which makes them leave their holes in the sand, swimming up to release their sperm by destroying their bodies, dying in the process. Torchlight must have been drawing them out as if it was the full moon or something. I'll be checking for ragworm mating season every time I'm planning to go spearfishing. Edit. People have been asking why I spearfish at night. Species are the same trout, flatfish, etc., but they're closer to the shore and more relaxed at night. In some countries, too many people take advantage of the fact that it's a bit easier to take the fish in the dark. This has led to spearfishers getting bad reputation. In many countries, spearfishing at night is illegal. So will it be in all of you this year because some spearfishers without moral are taking too many fish in southern Europe? It's sad to see the sport being ruined by people just wanting money, not caring for nature. I only take the fish I can eat for myself and my family, if I find any at all. So should anybody else. It's important to take care of the nature. Be responsible. Edit 2. In Denmark, the largest predators at sea are the seal and the porpoise, not nightmare fuel, just a tiny whale. It's quite safe to go in at night time in Denmark, besides the horny worms.
Okay, so I'm not sure if this is a creepy encounter, but it was pretty creepy for a Halloween day at sunset for me. I was walking my dog in Vermont on a class 4 road, a road that the town doesn't maintain well, about a quarter mile from my house, as I do almost every day for the past three years. There's a very short road that leads to the river and is right behind my neighbor's house, who also has a dog. As we were walking up the road, my dog pulled me into the woods about five steps. She was adamant about smelling whatever was over there. When I looked up, I saw the most vile thing I have ever seen, aside from a horror movie, the warm, steaming entrails of what must have been a large animal. We were still about ten feet away, so I paused for a moment, honestly thinking it was a Halloween prank. But what I believe happened was that a hunter had gutted an animal and left the guts in the woods. I was shaken at the sight, as I am not a hunter, and it was creepy and horrifying. We turned around, and I had to pick up my small dog because she was so interested in the smell. Although this isn't a well-maintained road, local people and tourists still use it. Three or four cars drove past me on our way down. I felt bad that my dog wasn't really getting her normal walk, so we went down the offshot road to the river, as we had done so many times before. It wasn't even a three-minute walk, and I want to stress that this is a road that people use, even though it leads to the river. As we approached the water, I could see the back of my neighbor's house at this point. I noticed that there was a gray jeep parked across the river. I pulled my dog back towards the main road, but she was in attack mode, because we'd never see people across the river, I think, and didn't want to come, so I coaxed her with some treats. Then the jeep's engine started. I started walking faster and picked up my dog. The jeep began inching towards the river and eventually across it. I'm running at this point up the hill. I was trying to call my sister using Siri on my phone because I was scared and I wanted someone to know what was happening. I got back up to the other road and started bolting towards a gated area because I didn't think the jeep could follow me. Before I could squeeze through the gate, the man yelled, Hey you, I need to talk to you. I was really scared, but I thought maybe if I was nice, he wouldn't kill me. He said, hey, just to let you know, it's hunting season, and I almost shot you. I actually do know it is hunting season, which is why both my dog and I had bright reflective pink vests on. I have never seen a hunter there in the six years I've lived on this road. You can't be walking there during hunting season. We all need to do our part, he said shortly. I abandoned my instinct to be kind at this point and said, I'll do my part, wearing a vest, if you do your part by not shooting at me. He didn't like that. He shook his head in anger and stepped on the gas, peeling away. I'm sorry for all the detail, but I want to emphasize that hunters have never been allowed to hunt so close to my home before, and I intend to contact our local game wardens and town clerk to confirm that on Monday just so we are all safe. Thanks for reading about my creepy encounter from Halloween. I will be locking myself in my bedroom for the rest of the night now. Back in 2005, a friend and I were walking home at about 2 o'clock in the morning about six kilometers across Narrabri, which edges the Pilliga Forest in New South Wales, Australia. We were going from one friend's place to another. We were only about one kilometer away from home on about a 500-meter stretch of, of straight road. We were walking along a sidewalk. My friend was pushing my BMX as we were just talking shit, as we usually did when all of a sudden something caught my eye. Two greyhound, like dogs, but larger, probably twice the size. They ran out of a block of flats and jumped the brick mailboxes on the inside of the footpath on the other side of the road, which stood about three to four feet high. Both of these dogs landed in the middle of the road and then ran in the opposite direction to which we were walking. As they ran further away, they grew larger and larger in size. While they grew larger, they seemed to begin to stand up on their hind legs and morph into some large, muscular werewolf-looking creature, and in my mind, I could not comprehend what I saw. 
These creatures ran around the corner in the exact direction we walked from in about five to ten seconds. After they turned the corner, we heard what sounded like a female child scream. At that point, we both looked at each other, and I could tell he saw what I had seen as he was just about to haul ass and bail on me on my bike. I jumped on the handlebars, and he pedaled like I've never seen before. I don't think he skipped a pedal for the whole rest of the trip home. When we got home, we locked the doors and closed the windows, and I asked him to explain exactly what he saw to me, and to no surprise, it was exactly as I had witnessed. He was an indigenous Australian, as was his elder brother. We explained the experience to him, and he said it was probably a yoey, which I believed at the time. But this story is not typical of yoey sightings in Australia. Safe to say, this scared me to go out at night for quite a while. We told a few people about the experience afterward, but most of the time people would laugh or joke that we were on drugs or brought up hairy man, which is a slang term for a yawi, while drinking. I can assure you this was the same thing we told them. This was a completely sober experience. After the joking and carrying on, I pretty much kept this story to myself, only telling a select few people who want to hear paranormal stories. I don't try to convince anyone if it's real or not. They can decide for themselves. I know what I saw. I go walking in the woods near my place, and three terrifying things have happened, and every single one was in the same section of trail. The first was one of the earliest times I went walking. I wasn't entirely sure of my timing to get to the opposite end of the woods and back, and I ended up walking two-thirds of the way back in the dark. I had a flashlight which I could use part of the time, but wasn't able to leave on. I would flash it on set my course, and walk until I felt I needed to check again. I'm walking through the pitch dark, and I hear something about fifty yards back scream. It scared the shit out of me. I picked up my pace a bit when suddenly whatever it was screamed again. About fifteen feet away at my eleven o'clock, I hadn't heard anything move, and I booked it. I leaned later that it may have been foxes, but I never went walking out there again without a means of self-defense. The second time was in late afternoon walk, same spot on the trail I was walking and it was almost Disney-like, birds singing, bugs chirping, squirrels. Squirreling, there was a small breeze, and it was lovely out. Suddenly, at the exact same time, the wind stopped, the sun dropped behind a cloud, and every single animal stopped doing anything. The entire woods went completely still and silent. I had never understood deafening silence until that moment. I tensed up and kept moving, and about ten seconds later, sound returned and everything went back to normal. I took the same way back, and it didn't happen again. The third time was about a month later. I was walking down that way, and I was looking about a little more, as this time I was out at midday, and it was as bright as deep woods gets. I noticed something off the trail and went to look at it. I found a deer trail that I could follow and realized that the high grass hit a deep ditch off the trail that the river cut out during flooding. It had been dry, so I dropped into it. I'm a big dude at about 6.5 feet tall, and the edge of this ditch was at my eye level and probably about 10 feet across. I decided to follow it and come out at the river and then work my way down the bank until I hit the trail again. I walked about 25 feet and had to work over a tree that had collapsed. Into the ditch at a curve in its path, I came to the other side and froze. There was deer everywhere, not plural deer. A single deer spread over the entirety of the ditch. The ribs were closest, the skull was across the ditch from them, and all the other bones were scattered about like it had hit a landmine. There was a definite stench to the area, and the bones were dry, but still had sinew strung about them in spots. It took me all of about three seconds to realize that I was standing in something's dining room. I backed up to the tree, used it as my point of egress from the ditch, and ignoring the voice in my head saying not to bust straight through the underbrush to the path. Busted straight through the underbrush to the path. I came out at, you guessed it, 
that creepy spot on the woods trail. I walked swiftly to a different trail and walked through the open field to get home. I don't know precisely what lies in that section of the woods, but it always freaks me out to see parents taking their toddlers out there to walk. It's a curvy path up to that section, which is a straightaway with flat ground and the underbrush making a well-defined path. I know people let their kids run up and down it since they can see all the way to end and the kids have the ability to run freely without being out of sight. I know it's probably not going to happen, but I always mentally see a kid running away from his parents down the path. A rustle of brush, a flash of fur, and the sound of little Billy being carried off into the woods. All right, first off, let me tell you a little bit of history about me. At the time of this event, my friend Brian and I were 14. Brian lived beside a very large forest. Well, Brian and I tended to go exploring a lot whenever we got the chance. Now we have been doing this since we were about 10 years old, so we never really saw any danger in this. We just did it so we had something to do. It was nearly sundown, and Brian wanted to go further out. Then what we usually did. I didn't know how far he wanted to go, so I just went with it. We followed our usual path for around 15 minutes until I started to notice that I didn't recognize where we were going. I thought that this is what Brian was talking about going further than usual, but he just kept on walking. After another 15 minutes of going on this unknown path until we came up on this abandoned, beat-up rive in the middle of the woods, I mean, it looked like a dozen guys with baseball bats just gave it there all on the shack. There were small holes through out the whole RV. Almost all the windows were broken, and there was dirt all over the RV. But the most strangest thing about it was the fruit on the ground. It was everywhere, and they were all eaten. Some of the fruit were fresher than others. In fact, some looked as if they were eaten a couple hours ago. Anyways, you couldn't step anywhere without stepping on this weird fruit. I couldn't even identify what type of fruit it was. It was greenish, dark black in the shape of a tangerine, but the texture of the fruit is what made it indistinguishable. It was unbelievably smooth, almost as if it were liquid. By this time, the sun had just dipped over the horizon, so it was getting really dark in the woods. As soon as I saw the RV, I felt this chill sensation that I have never felt before. It felt as if I just jumped into the frozen seas of Antarctica. I had chill bumps all over my body, and this all happened less than a second. I look over at Brian, and just from reading his expression, I knew he felt the same sensation. As I was just about to ask what was wrong, he just jerked his head, starring in the direction behind me. On instinct, I did the same, but I saw nothing. I asked him what he saw, but he said it was nothing, just shadows playing tricks on him. But I knew that whatever he thought he saw put him on edge. He jerked his head every five seconds. After about a minute of looking around, I turned back toward the RV. Now I'm a very curious person, and I wanted to see what was in that RV. I started to make my way forward over the sea of this weird, already eaten fruit. My friend Brian grabbed my hand and pulled me back. I looked at Brian, and he looked like he was on the edge of freaking out. He told me to not go in that RV. However, being the stubborn idiot I am, I didn't listen to him. I walked forward a little freaked out myself, because I knew there was something not right about this place. I stopped in front of the door and laid my hand on the door handle. As I was about to open it, Brian squeaked out from behind me. Please don't. Let's just go back to the house. I thought about this for a second, but curiosity won. I opened the door and peered in. Inside was so unexpected that I had to look twice to actually believe it. It was a regular RV. Almost nothing seemed strange on the inside. I was almost disappointed because I was expecting something very strange, but turned out to be a regular RV. I chuckled quietly to myself and walked back outside. I turned around to tell Brian it was nothing, but when I saw him, I stopped dead in my tracks. 
There was a humanoid shadowy figure standing around six foot to seven foot tall, was standing behind Brian almost twenty feet away. I was paralyzed and shocked, and it must have shown in my face, because Brian turned around and saw the figure too. But instead of coming to me or telling me to run, that little bastard bolted without me running in the general direction of his house. I just stood there, still petrified in shock. It was completely dark outside, so I couldn't see it well enough to identify anything about this thing. After about five seconds, I came back to reality and got the F out of there in the direction that Brian took. Now I'm a track champion, so I consider myself a very fast runner, if I do say so myself. As I was running, I could hear something chasing me. Now, I didn't see what was chasing me, so I didn't know if it was the same thing as I saw before, though I knew that whatever was chasing me was very large and humanoid because I heard the pattern of its footsteps, and it was definitely two legs. But whatever it was, was very fast. I could hear it get closer and closer to me until it was about ten feet behind me, judging by the sound. Now, after about five seconds, I heard the footsteps die down, but I didn't dare turn around. I kept on running until I caught up with Brian. As soon as I reached him, I finally turned around, but I didn't see anything. It was too dark to make out anything more than forty feet away as I was searching for the pursuer. I got the feeling that we were being watched. Now I know that we all get this feeling all the time, but this was different. I knew I was being watched by someone or something. Brian must have sensed it, too, because he said, let's keep on running to the house. After around five minutes, we saw his house and burst through the door and straight to his room. We didn't sleep at all that night, and we never adventured out in the woods again. After two years, Brian and his family moved to another house, and they live happily in their new home. But what happened in those woods still haunts me today. I always thought, what would have happened if that thing caught me? I leave these questions unanswered, because I don't like to dwell on that distant memory too much. I don't believe in paranormal things, however, whatever that thing was, wasn't human. I was working for a company based out of Hopkinsville, Kentucky, in the Fayette. North Carolina office. The Fayette, North Carolina office was being downsized and my position was being moved to Hopkinsville. No problem. Neither state is my home state and my wife is from Iraq, so no real ties. And it gives her a chance to experience other places. So we take a trip and let her see the town. I get a room at the Hampton Inn Suites where I have stayed enough to get platinum status. Nice, clean hotel with a nice little Mexican restaurant. You can walk, too, and have a margarita. We got room 103. We drive around and eat, unpack, shower, and watch TV. We turn off the light, and everything is cool. She's sleeping, and the bathroom light comes back on. It has a motion sensor on it. So I get back up, cycle the light, and go to bed. At about 2 a.m., the light comes back on, and I get up, cycle the light, and shut the door. No problem. I'll just tell a maintenance in the morning. At about 3 a.m., I have what I think is a nightmare. A rolling black mass covers the floor to the ceiling and comes out of the bathroom, reaching for me, about five feet from the bed. I wake up screaming, crawling backward towards the headboard. My wife doesn't wake up, which is weird. I have a surefire flashlight on the nightstand, so I fire it up and nothing is there. I can see the bathroom light is on again. I go back to sleep writing it off as due to stress. I tell maintenance about the light issue. I come back from my office and my wife says they came by and replaced the switch. Problem solved, right? No, not really. We were there three days, and I had the same exact experience each night, and my wife woke up one of the nights moaning in her sleep. I didn't say anything about what I was seeing, and she just said she wasn't sleeping well. She hates hotels, is from Iraq, and is not really used to a hotel stay. So once again, I kept my mouth shut, not wanting to look like an idiot. 
We got back to North Carolina just fine, and we were watching a ghost show on television, and I said, Babe, when we were staying at Hopkinsville, did anything weird happen while you were sleeping? She said, Yeah. I asked, What happened? She said, I saw a black cloud that was taller than you, that looked like it had snakes in it and arms that reached towards the bed. I explained that I had seen a very similar thing, and she was like, I was scared to say anything because I was afraid you'd laugh at me. This was real to both of us. I came back to stay a couple of months later by myself and requested the same room just to see if it would happen again. When I requested the room, I was told it was being remodeled because of water damage. That's plausible. Two months after this, I was meeting one of my editors from North Carolina to help her get checked in and go out to eat. Knowing the front desk folks, I asked about the room again. I asked if she could have room 301. She smiled at me and said, We turned that into a storage because of a parking lot noise. I asked, Are you sure people haven't complained about something else? She just smiled at us. So draw your conclusions. I've been seeing what I call werewolves pretty much since I've been little, and I've had encounters with them ever since then, too. Nothing really ever happens with them. We just look at each other, and they end up going about their business. But I did have one terrible encounter, and it was the most horrible and terrifying thing that I've ever encountered. It was when I was truck driving in Ohio. I still have nightmares about it, actually. I parked my shipper receiver one night. I dropped my trailer I'd been pulling because it takes a while for them. To unload and load my trailer, I got there the evening before I was supposed to be there. I dropped the trailer and pulled out from under it and parked away from it, just on the other side of this dirt parking lot. This place is kind of near the woods, and not many people live around here. There's actually a lot of woods around it. I pulled my front curtains in my cab and left my truck running and cooked some food for me in my pit bull. He always comes with me. He's my baby boy. After we ate, it was getting dark, and I took him for a walk before we'd settle in for the night. That's when I would go play some modern warfare with my squad. My boy was acting kind of weird, though, looking all around and sniffing, not really like him at all. It was like he was in serious protective mode when we were walking around those woods. It was way too quiet where we were, too. No bugs, nothing making any kind of noise. He finally settled down, and we went back to my truck, and I got on my Xbox. A few hours later, he starts acting very protective again and starts growling at the side of the truck where I was sitting, which would be the passenger side. I just thought I made him mad or something, so I started loving on him. But he wouldn't stop growling and staring at that side of the truck. So I decided to take off my headset and listen, and that's when I could hear the unmistakable sound of something outside walking around by me. It sounded big, and it sounded really close to the area of the truck that I was in. Then out of nowhere, I heard this deep guttural growl. It sounded off right next to the door, and then the truck rocked back and forth. Our trucks are heavy and it takes a lot to rock the truck side to side, but this thing rocked my truck nonetheless. I'm gonna admit I started to freak out a little bit. My boy jumped into my lap to protect me. I mean, his hair was up. He was growling. He scared the hell out of me. He's never done that before. It was a very serious, tense moment, but it was also a huge comfort to know that he was so protective over me. I finally got up because something told me to just check my doors. I needed to make sure they were locked, so I started with the passenger side, since that's where I was at. I pulled the curtain back to take a peek, and I looked down at the side of my cab. I still regret looking down there to this day. There was this huge, bulky, tall werewolf, and it had these glowing red eyes. I'll never forget the way it looked when it was beside the truck. It was around eight feet tall and had a very muscular body like a bodybuilder. It had long, hairy arms with human-like hands and these razor-sharp claws at the end of them. If you've ever seen the movie Bad Moon, it looked almost exactly like that. 
but it had very dark brown or black hair instead of gray, and it had those red eyes that just seemed to glow in the night. And just looking into them, you could tell that it wanted to harm me. It was something that I want to forget. It's something that I wish I could still forget, and I wish I never would have seen. I mean, I was frozen in place by looking into his eyes, and so damn scared down to my very soul. Like I said, I've been seeing creatures like this in my whole life, but none like this. This one was different than the rest. This one was evil, and it was dangerous, and I really think it wanted to kill me. I knew that I might lose my life that night. My dog attacked the side of the truck, and it seemed to snap me out of my fear. My mind was racing billions of thoughts a second. I really couldn't focus. But I went to look back and realized that my door was not locked and the curtain was still open, and it looked like this thing was reaching for the damn handle. I freaked out and slammed the door lock button. It locked, and about the same time, this creature started pulling the handle, and it wouldn't open, thank God. When it realized the door was locked, it seemed to piss it off. I mean, seriously, piss this thing off. It let out this awful howl that was so loud and terrible that I could feel it vibrating inside of my bones. It freaked me out even more, and I was laying down on the floor, crying and praying for my life. Then my guardian angel, my dog, my boy, he's down on the floor, nudging me, licking me, whining, telling me that it's okay, that he was scared too, and we just needed to get the hell out of there. I came back to my senses. I jumped in the driver's seat and ripped down the curtains. I slammed the stick shift into gear and tried to get away, but I forgot I had the parking brake on. I slammed it in and started to drive off. I finally hit the road and then turned onto the main street and almost wrecked because I was going way too fast. From where we were, there was this field that was about the size of a football field. That was from the warehouse to the road. I looked through the field, and from there where we were, I saw that werewolf still standing there, and then he took off running on his back two legs, and within just a few seconds, he was right there, almost to the road. He ran with his arms stretched out and his very big teeth showing like he was smiling and chasing his prey. About that time, he leapt towards the truck. Now I'm doing at least 45 to 50 miles per hour, and it looked like he was about to jump right on the truck, but he missed it, and he hit the other side of the road. Instantly, though, it jumped back on two legs and back under the road. It chased me for about another 10 seconds or so, and then it just stopped. I never stopped, though. I just kept going, speeding down the road until I could get the truck about 30 miles away. When I got there, I found a place to park and jumped in the back. My mind wouldn't rest, though. It was trying to tell me that this was not real and that it didn't just happen. But it did just happen, and it was real. I just grabbed my dog and snuggled up with him the rest of the night. I managed to fall asleep, but all I could think about and dream about was that werewolf and that it might have been my last night alive. I kept this a secret from everyone, including my mom and my wife, for a very long time. And when I finally told them, it was like this weight had been lifted. They both cried because they knew that very well might have been my last night alive, and they were definitely happy that it wasn't. So be careful out there in this world. These creatures are out there. Some mean you harm, and some don't. Just don't ever go looking for them. And if you do cross paths with them, just be careful, really, really careful, and always be on the Lord. I know so many people might doubt the story, but it's my true story. Believe it or not, it doesn't matter to me. I just want you guys out there to always stay safe and alert. A few years ago, during the middle of the night, five convicts, all serving life sentences, escaped Westbrook Penitentiary in Nova Scotia, Canada, Michael Smith, age 27, Jake Thompson, age 32, Sam Johnson, age 36, George Miller, age 29, and Lawrence Rogers, age 41, made their daring escape. While making their escape, they stumbled upon an abandoned farm, or so they thought, 20 kilometers away from the penitentiary, 
Two days later, two of the convicts told the warden the gruesome details of what happened to them at that farm. This is a story as told by one of the convicts, Michael Smith. I and the boys had been planning our escape for months. Our plan was to make it down to the United States, if we could, where no one would know who, would know who we are. We knew we had to get as far away from here as possible. We made our escape in the middle of the night, about 2 a.m., I think. Once making it past the walls, we started running north and planned to turn west once we made it past the Memram Cook River. I'm not sure how far we ran or for how long, but the sun was rising as a farm came into view. We were tired, hungry, and thirsty, and figured we'd run far enough away that we could take a break for a while. When we got close to the farm, I could see it looked old and decaying, like it hadn't been used in years. The house looked dirty, and the bushes surrounding it were overgrown. The barn looked like it was going to crumble in on itself. We weren't sure if anyone still lived there, so we approached the house slowly and carefully. As we got within a few meters of the house, we decided three of us would go to the back door in case people in the house decided to try and run out the back, and the other two would knock on the front door to see if anyone was home. If there were people there, our plan was to tie them up so we could get something to eat and drink before we continued running. I went to the back door with two of the other boys and stood there waiting to see if anyone came running out the door. A few minutes went by when the door suddenly opened, and it was Jake. He said there was no one in the house, so the rest of us went inside so we could start looking for some food and something to drink. The inside of the house was as bad as the outside. It was filthy and smelled musty. It looked like some wild animals had been living there for some time. We hunted around for some food, and all we could find were several cans of meat and beans. The faucet inside the house didn't work, so Jake told Sam to go outside to see if there was a well nearby. Ten minutes went by before we heard Sam yelling, Get out here now! We all took off, running out the back door. Once outside, we heard Sam again. I'm in the barn. Get in here now, as we ran towards the barn. We could see the barn doors were slightly open. Before going inside, we paused for a moment, looking at each other, not knowing what to expect. We were already jittery and on edge. I was the first one inside the barn, which was somewhat dark. As I stepped inside and my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I could see Sam in front of me with a strange look on his face. I then happened to notice out of the corner of my eye what appeared to be a man a couple of meters away from Sam. I looked over to his direction and could see it was, in fact, a man. He was standing there staring at me. He had long silver hair that went past his shoulders and looked to be about sixty years of age. As the rest of the boys came in behind me, they stopped dead in their tracks as well when they saw the man. We stood there looking at both Sam and the man for a bit before Jake spoke up and asked, Who are you, old man? Do you live here? The man didn't answer. He just continued staring at me without uttering a word. A minute went by before Jake again asked the man who he was and if he lived there, this time more sternly. Another minute went by before the old man slowly turned his head, so he was now looking at Jake and responded in a calm, confident voice. I do live here and have for a long time. I noticed the old man had a slight accent that I couldn't quite place at the moment. Jake then said, Sam, George, grab that chair over there and find some rope to tie up the old man. They both knew Jake's temper well, so they wasted no time in grabbing a chair. That was nearby and finding some bailing twine. As they grabbed and tied the old man to the chair, he didn't fight back or say anything. He continued staring at Jake with an expressionless look on his face. It was an ache that went through me. Something was not right about this man. I thought back to my childhood, remembering how my father was, and spotting evil had become second nature to me. I kept my thoughts to myself, though. Showing weakness in front of the boys was not something I was going to do. Jake then instructed Sam to go grab the canned food we'd found in the house and asked him if he'd found a well with water in it, to which Sam replied he had. As Sam left, Jake turned his gaze towards the old man and asked, What's your story, old man? And asked, What's your story, old man? 
How do you live in a hellhole like this? The old man didn't respond at first. He just sat there glaring at Jake. When he finally spoke, he said, Let me tell you gentlemen a story, since it looks like I might be here for a spell. I was born a very long time ago in a small village in France. When I was a young man about your age, something terrible happened to me. It has led me to be unable to die since. I no longer fear death. I long for it. Each day that passes is one more day I must remain on this God-forsaken earth. Judging by your tired gentlemen, I can see where you came from. I do not care what your business is or what plans you have. I only ask you leave before nightfall. Right then, Sam startled as he walked in with a canned food and a bucket of water. We all jumped a little, and Jake made light of the situation, saying, Crazy old man, Sam, bring me the food and water. What the old man said, and the way he said it, frightened me. This was not the way a crazy person talks or behaves. I looked over at the old man, who then lowered his head and was quiet. We then went and sat down in an area of the barn that was light enough for us to see when we ate. As we sat, we passed around the cans of food, sharing what little we had. The rest of the boys made light-hearted conversation about what their plans were when we made it to America. But I couldn't shake the unnerving feeling this old man was dangerous. After we finished eating, Jake said, Someone needs to go take first watch on the loft. The area surrounding us is wide open for several kilometers, so it would be best to travel by night so we don't get spotted. We crossed several rivers on the way here and went upstream, a ways before going back on land, so it should take the dogs a while to find our scent. George then said he'd take first watch as the rest of us went to different parts of the barn to try and get comfortable so we could get some sleep. The next thing I remember was being awakened by Lawrence shaking me, saying it was my turn to watch as he had just finished, which meant I'd been asleep for several hours. As I made my way to the loft, I looked over at the old man. He was glaring at me again with an expressionless look on his face. He didn't seem to be at all worried that five escaped convicts had tied him to a chair with no idea of what could happen next. When I made it to the loft and looked outside through one of the windows, I could see it was getting to be late afternoon, which meant we'd be leaving in a few hours. I wondered what Jake had in mind for the old man before we left. I sat down on a barrel the other boys had been using to watch from and drifted off into my thoughts when suddenly I startled myself awake as I'd fallen asleep. I jumped off the barrel and noticed it was almost dusk. I hurried down the ladder to see if the boys were still asleep, which they had to be. Otherwise, they'd have woken me up by now for sure. As I got down off the ladder and looked in the old man's direction, I couldn't believe what I saw. He was just gone. I ran over to the chair to check and could see the bailing twine we'd used to tie him up was ripped to shreds lying on the ground. I yelled to the boys to wake up and come quick. Within seconds, they all came running over to my side and were as unnerved as I was. Lawrence and George had tied him up well, and he didn't look strong enough to rip through the bailing twine. The barn was quickly getting dark inside, so I asked Jake what we should do now when suddenly we heard a noise coming from one of the rooms in the back of the barn. Lawrence spoke up and said, Jake, let's get out of here. It's hard to see in here, and we need to leave anyway. I'm not leaving without giving. The old man a proper goodbye, if you know what I mean. He knows we're escaped convicts. That's got to be him back there in one of those rooms. If you guys are too scared to go back there to get him with me, then just wait here, said Jake. Fine, but hurry the hell up, I responded. Jake started slowly walking to the back of the barn. There were at least three rooms in the back and several stables. Jake always acted like a tough guy, but deep down I thought he was a coward. The four of us watched as Jake disappeared into the darkness. It was getting hard to see in the barn except for a sliver of moonlight from the rising moon that was starting to come down through the cracks in the old wood. At that point, I was sweating and shaking so badly with fear, I thought I might pass out, when suddenly I heard something let out a growl as Jake screamed out, You son of a! Then he was cut off! The four of us wasted no time in moving to get the hell out of there. We turned and ran towards the barn doors, which were a few meters behind us. 
When we hit the doors and tried pushing them open, they wouldn't open. We fumbled around for a bit, trying to figure out why we couldn't open the doors when we found out why. Someone had put a chain through the doors with a padlock on it, locking us in. Oh, hell, what are we going to do now? asked George. Find a way out. Come on, we need to get out of here now. Let's see if we can find somewhere we can squeeze through, I responded. We started feeling our way along the barn wall, trying to see if we could find an opening, when I heard what sounded like another growl, then something on four legs running fast towards us. I shouted out, What is that? Suddenly, and without warning, Lawrence let out a blood-curdling scream and cried out, Help! Something's got me! He continued screaming, when suddenly it was as if something ripped out his throat, and the screaming immediately stopped. George then yelled, Come on, Johnny, let's get the hell out of here now. I didn't say anything. I just started to run away from Lawrence's screams as fast as I could. As I ran through that dark barn, I kept running into things, almost knocking myself out several times. When I came to what I thought was the back of the barn, I turned around and stood there trying to catch my breath. As I stood there, I noticed it was dead silent. Nothing was moving or making noise. It was as if the world had come to a halt. A few minutes went by when I heard someone whisper, John, is that you? It's me, Jake. I think I found a way out of here. Come here. I immediately stiffened up and froze. I thought to myself, I heard Jake scream something awful. Could he still be alive? Then again, I heard someone whispering from the dark. Come on, Johnny. Get over here. I wasn't sure what to do, but I knew I didn't want to stand there waiting to be next. I slowly started creeping towards the sound of Jake's voice, when I heard Lawrence's blood-curdling screams coming from the loft area. I started moving faster towards Jake's voice, when suddenly I stumbled upon something lying on the floor. It made a grunting sound, which made me jump back. Johnny, it's me, Jake. Help me up. I reached down to help Jake up when my hand touched a pool of warm liquid on the ground. I put my hand up to my nose and could smell a distinct smell of blood. I fumbled around a bit more until I found Jake's arm and helped him up off the barn floor. It was then I noticed the light from the moon coming in and could see the way out Jake had said he'd found. We hurried as fast as we could. Jake was torn up badly and bleeding. When we got to the hole... The light was coming through, I pushed on the barn's paneling, and it opened up just enough that we could fit through. Once outside, we started heading back the way we'd come. I couldn't stop looking over my shoulder as I helped Jake along, thinking we were for sure next. We continued walking all night to try and get as far away from the farm as possible. When it got light enough, we found a busy road to try and get some help. It didn't take long for people to figure out we were escaped convicts, and then we were picked up by the police. I thought Jake was going to die sometime during the night, but the tough bastard held on. After Michael Smith told his story to the warden, the warden informed the local police, who then went to investigate the farm. When they went inside the barn, several of the officers mentioned that it smelled like an animal's den. While searching the barn, they found the old man on the loft sitting in a chair reading a book. When asked who he was, his response was calm and collected. What took you so long? He was placed under arrest for the suspected murders of Sam Johnson, George Miller, and Lawrence Rogers. As the search in the barn continued, they found a hidden room under one of the rooms, containing the bones of several dozen people, including Sam and Lawrence. The bones had been picked clean except for some fairly fresh tissue that still covered them. Over the next month, a thorough search of the entire premises was conducted. There was never an exact count of how many bodies they found, but they suspected as many as 100 different bodies may have been discovered on the farm. Unfortunately, George's body or bones were never recovered. The authorities also searched the house, finding many old items dating back to the 1700s, including an old photograph that matched the old man. Experts determined that the photograph dated back to the 1850s and was taken in France. However, no one could ascertain how or when the old man came to live on the farm, as it had been abandoned for 30 years. The old man was sentenced to prison 
where he remained until 1984. Then one summer day in 1984, he vanished from his cell. A search was organized, but he was never found. In the years that followed, another family purchased the land where the farm was located. They reported sightings of a strange older man walking around the outskirts of the farm, sometimes just standing there, staring before disappearing back into the trees. The old man never gave his name to the authorities, so his nickname became the old man. When the warden asked the old man if the story Michael Smith told was true, the old man simply replied, I don't deny it. As for Michael's fellow escapee, Jake, he survived his injuries, but needed to have his left arm amputated due to the severe damage it suffered. His account corroborated with Michael's story. When the warden asked Michael what he thought killed the other men, Michael's response was hauntingly simple, a werewolf. The case of the old man in the mysterious farm remains one of the eerie and unexplained incidents in local folklore, leaving many questions unanswered and shrouded in mystery. Not a horror story as such, but just a really weird situation. I'm in Australia, so this is a gum tree, a.k.a. our version of Craig's List. Story, a few months back I get a phone call from a random older man who is clearly very, very, very drunk, and he's asking for me by name, full name, and talking about how his mom had bought something off me probably ten years ago. It was creepy because he's telling me about where I live and telling me how I looked then, that he had driven his mom to my place to pick up whatever the heck it was that I had sold. I have absolutely no recollection of it. I didn't hang up because I was so off-put by this random person saying this stuff, and it was just so weird. He must have realized that he was creeping me out a bit, and he apologized, and that's when he's explained that his mom had passed away, and he's going through her address book, and came across my name and number, and it reminded him of the times he used to take her places. I have bought a lot, sold some on Gumtree over the years, and have never felt worried about going to someone's home or having someone come here, until this phone call, but when he finally put some context into the call... It eased my mind. It was just an older bloke grieving for his mom. I've been looking to sell my car before the summer is over, so I took to Facebook and Craigslist to find potential buyers in the area who were willing to take it off my hands. I posted my ad on Facebook Marketplace, which is essentially Craigslist for Facebook, where you can buy and sell products around your approximate location. I figured it would be the perfect place to find someone near me who was in the market for an old fixer. Upper. My piece of junk, that is. I should add at this point that I'm a 22-year-old woman and on Marketplace. Obviously, you post from your Facebook account. So whoever sees my post can go to my profile to message me. Unfortunately, unlike Craigslist, people knew exactly who I was before they were buying. I had several people interested, so I answered them in order, and the first person just so happened to be an older woman. From her page, she looked harmless, so I thought it would be no problem. I was busy for a few days, so I told her I'd get back to her soon, and she said, Okay. Her last message to me said, that's fine. Let me know Thursday, Bill. A little weird, but I thought maybe her husband was messaging me for her from her account. Or maybe it was even a typo. Who knows? I gave her the benefit of the doubt. On Thursday, I got a random message from another account, a man who we'll call Bill. He messaged me the exact same message as she did the day before, which was something along the lines of interested. When can I come see it? I put two and two together and realized that the woman signed Bill on her last message the day before, and I figured it was her husband now contacting me from his own account. I asked if he was the one who messaged me from her account the day before, and he confirmed, saying that she was his wife who had passed away back in March. Strange, but everyone has their own way of coping. At this point, I felt bad for the guy, and there weren't really any alarm bells going off. 
Other than that, it was slightly weird. He was contacting me from his dead wife's Facebook. It was also weird that his Facebook didn't have any photos of himself, just his backyard as his profile picture and cover photo. I chalked it up to him being older and not caring about social media. He ended up saying he'd like to see the car, and we scheduled a day for him to come look at it. Unfortunately, I had to give him my house address because the car's brakes are not in working order and the car isn't insured, so I couldn't take it on the road to somewhere nearby to meet up. Regardless, I was still not too worried because my boyfriend and his mother were at the house. I live with them in the summertime, so I thought, if push came to shove, there would be someone there to mediate. He was supposed to come at three, thirty, but three. Thirty came and went without him showing up. He said he lived in a town about a half hour away, so we waited a little while after to see if maybe he would come late. I was pissed for a while because he'd just wasted my time confirming he wanted to see my car and possibly buy it, and he stood me up without any explanation. Around four, I gave up and started playing some games on my laptop. My boyfriend, bless his soul, still kept watch over the driveway to see if Bill would come out after all. Suddenly, he had urgency in his voice. Alyssa, I think that's him. I got up and ran to the window just in time to see a small car with an unknown driver and a young man in the front seat pull away from the front of our driveway. Apparently, the car pulled in front of the house and sat there for several seconds before driving away, and I just caught the tail end of it. I live on a quiet side street of a pretty safe suburban neighborhood, so it most likely wasn't some random stranger who just so happened to be passing by. They were definitely in front of the house, waiting for a minute. My boyfriend looked disturbed and kept repeating that he was sure it was them, and that they got cold feet. We all thought it was weird that they would drive a half hour only to leave. My boyfriend's mother said she thought it was because they thought they could get me, a vulnerable young woman, alone, and that they'd sped away once they saw that there were several cars in the driveway. One of the cars was the one I was selling, too, and it looked exactly like in the photos I posted on Marketplace, so I was sure the car wasn't the issue. The most disturbing thing to me was the fact that there were two people in the car, and at least one of them looked like he was capable of doing something. Should I have been alone? Thank God in hindsight that there were several people home, or the situation definitely could have escalated. I really, really wish I hadn't given them my address, and I can only hope that those people don't ever come back. My park ranger patrol had become so sleepy that I began taking the liberty of spending the earliest part of it walking one of the shorter trails. It's technically not a bad thing to do. It just meant that I wouldn't be able to speed off to respond to any incidents right away. But I was coming up on week six without any kind of alert, so I began to relax my approach to things. And yes, Murphy's Law has a way of singling people like me out. I was at the point on the trail that was the furthest from my car when I had heard a horrible shrieking that shattered the silence of the forest. I was torn between sprinting back to my car and just running to where the screaming seemed to be coming from. But when you're surrounded by trees like that, it's pretty impossible to gauge just how far away any sound is. I opted for doing the whole thing on foot, promising myself that I'd never leave my car behind again. The screaming continued, and I seemed to be zeroing in on it. But when I thought I was going to come up on a source, it would suddenly be another 15 seconds of running away. I wondered if I was having hearing issues, or if the acoustics of the forest were just so unfortunately arranged that that screwed with my perceptions badly. But it kept happening. My urgency began to melt into suspicion. I did the worst thing that any park ranger could do in a situation like that, and I stopped chasing. Instead, I began creeping. I crept up through the tall grasses, ducking behind trees, trying to get as close to the noise as I could, before whatever it was could give me the slip again. It worked. Peering out from behind my tree, I saw something that was only vaguely human, from its head to its neck to its shoulders. 
was a stretched membrane of skin that almost made it look like a nun's headwear, except it was skin. The whole thing was nude and seemed to be of the female persuasion. Its chest was flat and long and pendulous. The eyes were gaping and yellowed. The mouth was something else, and it stretched open, almost like it was distended, unhinged like a snake's jaw, and the unnaturally yawning cavity bellowed another plaintive cry of distress. The polarity of everything changed in that very moment. I was being deceived, but deceived into what I didn't know. I put one hand on my pistol just to be safe, and I began to back away from the direction I was heading. The creature, or whatever, swayed as if anxious, and it let out another longer, louder cry. I just kept backing up. This caused the creature to scream again, but not in distress. It was a hell of an enraged predator, deprived of a meal. It rocketed toward me propelling itself through its strides with its knuckles. Like that of a gorilla, in the time that it took me to bring my pistol up to an aiming position, the creature was close enough for me to spit on. Luck was on my side at the last possible second. My shot landed right between the eyes of it, and it face planted hard into the ground. Here's the part that might get rejected from being read. I got ready to radio out and tell the office what I'd just experienced, but the body of the creature slowly crumbled into a pile of white pulsating embers that cooled off into gray ashes. I poked at the pile for bones or anything, but there was nothing left. I quickly told the main office that there was nothing wrong, and when they questioned me, I just told them off. I quickly dismissed anything and told them I didn't feel well, and then shortly afterwards I quit that job entirely. In late 2008, I came one night to find my mom sitting in the kitchen, all alone and in floods of tears. When I asked her what was wrong, her answer made my jaw drop. My dad had left her. There was absolutely no indication that anything was wrong with their marriage or that he was remotely unhappy. But that afternoon and while I was out, he had apparently packed a few things into a suitcase, told her he was leaving and just disappeared. I only mention this because it explains why my mom and little sister just didn't want to be in the house over Christmas and New Year. That kind of family-orientated time of year would just been way too hard on them. So they basically buggered off to Mexico for a month to just decompress or whatever. Point being, I was all alone for Christmas and New Year. Christmas Day sucked, and I realized they were seriously right about not wanting to be alone in the house at that time of year. So for New Year's Eve, I decided to throw a little get-together for me and a load of my mates, hoping that a little party might take away some of the sadness I felt as a result of my dad leaving. So on the night itself, it ends up being about 20 to 30 of us getting together in my parents' place, getting drunk, listening to music, playing Xbox, just a big hangout among some of the people I was closest to. It was a really good night to start off with, and it really did help take my mind off things for a little while. We did the whole New Year's countdown thing, set off a fire fireworks, generally having a brilliant little night together. But the drunker we all got, the messier things became until it was just a medley of people throwing up, having sex in the spare bedroom or arguing among themselves. Two of the people who ended up fighting were my mate Chris and his girlfriend at the time, a girl called Katie. From what I could gather, Katie thought Chris had been flirting with a mutual friend of ours and had taken issue with it. Chris was insisting they were just being friendly and it was nothing to worry about. But Katie was adamant that something was going on, that he was cheating on her. Blah, 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 you know how it is. Blah, 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 you know how it is. Teenage drama. Now I know Chris really did love her, so it wasn't like a stand-up argument. It was more like him begging her to see reason and to not go mad and dump him over some perceived bit of flirting. He swore he'd never do anything like that that she was the only girl for him, how much he loved her, all this romantic, theatrical stuff that you might expect from two young lovers. It wasn't really any of my business, though, so me and the other party guests just sort of left them to it while we got on with trying to have fun. 
Then a little while later, I find Chris sitting in the back garden, swigging off a bottle of raw vodka on his own. I go up to him to ask if he's okay, only to find that he's crying rotten drunk, saying that Katie has dumped him and gone home. I tried to be a good friend and console him as best I could, saying that she was probably just drunk and over-emotional, and how there was a good chance they'd just get back together over the next couple of days when she realized she'd made a mistake. But he was insistent. She was gone for good, and they wouldn't be getting back together. All I could do was get him on his feet and hug it out with him. The poor guy really was in one hell of a state. I managed to convince him to hand over the vodka, drink some water, and then get some sleep in my bed so he could maybe sober up a wee bit before heading on home. He agrees I tuck him in and then leave him to get some rest. About an hour or so later, the party is winding down and the remainder of us are just chilling in the TV room when someone goes off to use the toilet. They return like seconds later, saying someone's in the bathroom throwing up, then asking if they can go and take a piss in the back garden. Of course I tell them no. I didn't want them pissing all over my mom's flower beds, and that I'll nip upstairs to see if I can get whoever it is out of the bathroom. So I get the toilet upstairs, and I can hear someone gagging and retching on the other side of the locked door. My friend Julia joins me a wee bit concerned and starts trying to help me talk to the person who's locked themselves in the bathroom. It's some time then that I notice the two doors are open, the first being my bedroom, the second being a little cupboard on the first floor landing. I check my bedroom and see that the bed is empty, so it's obviously Chris that's in the bathroom, puking his guts up because of all the vodka he drank. I shut the door to the bedroom, then go to close the door of the other room, which happened to be a little cupboard that my mom kept cleaning supplies in. My first thought was that Chris had opened up that door, thinking it was the bathroom in his drunken haze, then legged it to the right bathroom in his desperation to puke. But I noticed something that, at first, I didn't really understand the significance of. The cleaning supplies that my mom usually kept all neat in a little plastic box were spilled all over the floor. Not like open fluid spilling out. They were just all out of the box like someone had been rooting through them. As I'm wondering why someone would do something like that, Julia calls out that the person who'd locked themselves in the bathroom, presumably Chris, had gone quiet all of a sudden and that they weren't responding. That's when I put two and two together. Violent vomiting, cleaning supplies missing, deep, drunken depression. Chris was trying to kill himself. I absolutely pegged it to the bathroom door and started trying to kick the door off the hinges. Julia screams in shock at what I'm doing, and people from the living room start piling out of towards the bottom of the stairs in utter confusion. I'd been really protective of the house all night not wanting people smoking inside, not wanting people pissing anywhere they shouldn't, trying to stop spillages and all that. Then there I was, booting down my own bathroom door. It was way too heavy to actually kick off the hinges, but I did manage to kick a hole in the wood paneling, and that's when I got a look inside. Christ was lying there, a bottle of bleach next to him, and there was like pink puke all over the cistern, the floor and his claws. It was pink because he drank the bleach and it had corroded or burned the inside of him so much that he had vomited up blood. We were distraught, terrified, almost sure he was dead. But we were damned quick to call an ambulance. Chris had his stomach pumped and he survived, but it took a long time for him to be back to normal. Because he puked, the fumes had damaged his lungs or something. I'm not a doctor, so don't have a go if I get the details wrong. So he had trouble eating, drinking, and breathing for at least a month after that. Twelve years, and I've never forgotten that, and I'm pretty sure neither is he. Because as far as I know, Chris never drank vodka again, because if the smell of it makes me think of that night, God knows what horrible memories it brings back for him. I just got back from a week-long trip to Florida. My fiancé and I were visiting her parents who own a home in Boca Raton, and I was hoping to get a fishing trip in with her father Jim while I was there. 
The Everglades aren't too far from where they live, and her dad owned a small boat. And since he's retired, he spends a good deal of time taking it out on some of the local lakes. I ran the idea of fishing the glades past him, and he seemed to be just as excited as me. Despite being in the vicinity, he had actually never fished it. Well, a few days after we got there, we made arrangements and set out early in the morning, toying his boat behind us. It wasn't one of the boats from the movies, you know, with the big fans. It was a nice little 14-foot tracker, which was perfect for the narrow waterways. We're both kind of anti-technology YouTube videos, and computer solitaire is the extent of our interest. Select fools, neither one of us brought a satellite jeeps, and we both left our phones in the truck. Anyway, we got to the glades and got the boat in the water around nine. We planned to fish around two and then head back home and be there in time for dinner. We hadn't planned on getting lost. It was a blast at first. We saw a few alligators, which I'd never seen in the wild. We stopped to fish a few times and even caught a few large mass each. I guess around one pine when we figured we should start heading back in the direction we came. We were both adept at navigation and kept aware of when and where we had turned, but it didn't really help. We had seriously underestimated the labyrinth of channels and canals, and it didn't take us long to realize that we'd gotten lost in the maze of the Everglades. We weren't panicking yet, but by this time it was well past 2 p.m., and we couldn't tell if we'd made any progress or not. We had just come around the turn of yet another channel when I saw something bizarre. Something that had been standing along one of the banks dove into the water just as we made the turn. I only caught a glimpse of it, but it had been standing upright on two legs and had a green scaly complexion. I convinced myself that it was just an alligator and maybe the sun had caught it at a weird angle. Besides, we had bigger problems. The sun was getting low in the sky, and we hadn't seen a single other person. We didn't have much water, and we were still completely lost. I really regret thinking I was macho enough to not need a GPS. A few canals later, I happened to turn around and caught sight of something in the water right behind the boat. It looked like an alligator, but it was moving way too fast, and it was speeding directly towards me. I was in the back on the motor, and I gunned the throttle in surprise response. A bunch of things happened at once. Not expecting the sudden shift in speed, my soon-to-be father-in-law fell back against the side of the boat and tumbled into the water. At the same time, the creature that had been tailing us rose out of the water and lashed out toward me with a set of razor-sharp claws. When I say rose, I mean stood up on two legs like a human would. Gunning the engine is probably what saved me as the swipe fell short. I burst forward a few feet and got a good look at this thing. The water was around five feet deep there, and this thing was standing up the water line around its waist. It had a pair of thickly muscled arms, each sporting one of those clawed fists that had almost decapitated me. Greenish-black scales ran the length of it and then terminated it in a flat head, jaw open, bearing two rows of serrated teeth. I saw Jim hit the water and immediately start splashing around. I knew he could swim, but being launched from a boat into alligator-infested waters is probably the kind of thing to cause you to panic. The only problem was that this thing was between me and Jim. I couldn't leave him, and I couldn't get around this thing. There was no room. I'm not saying I'm brave, because I certainly didn't feel courageous in the moment. But I turned the boat around quickly, twisted the throttle as far as I could in charge. The bow of the boat lifted into the air. I couldn't see past it, but I felt an impact, and the boat shuddered, almost tipping to the left. I let go of the throttle and pulled alongside the frantic Jim and grabbed his arm. I started hauling him in and looked back over my shoulder. The wake from the short burst was lapping against both sides of the channel in thick rings of water flowing away from where I guessed the creature had been. It was nowhere in sight. I brought Jim into the boat and not too gently threw him to the deck, plopped back down next to the motor, and sped away up the channel. We didn't see the creature again. After a few hours, we eventually ran into a group of guys who led us back to the boat ramp. We were only about 20 minutes away and had pretty much been going in circles the whole time. 
We each had about a dozen missed calls from our wives. I think Jim was pretty upset with me, but eventually he came around and laughed it off. He had never actually seen the thing and thought I had just overreacted to an alligator. But I know that it wasn't. Alligators don't stand on two feet and they don't attack with their claws. I don't know if it's a species of animal that hasn't been encountered yet or a weird human alligator hybrid, but whatever it is, it probably shouldn't exist. I worked as a park ranger for a time in the Black Hills of South Dakota. My goal after graduating college with a degree in conservation was to work somewhere in the Rockies. But a job working the blackout wilderness came up and I took it. The blackout wilderness is home to Blackout Peak, formerly Harney Peak, and is the highest point of South Dakota. Fortunately, it's a very scenic and decently easy route to the top that most hikers can manage. Unfortunately, that meant a lot of tourists. In coupled with the fact that we were in Custer State Park, which is home to a couple of large bison herds that are easily spotted from the road, the Taurus flocked there in droves. It wasn't that I hated the Taurus. Wilderness areas need tourists for income. It was just that I had expected to work more with nature and less with people. Twice a week I was scheduled to patrol a watchtower at the top of the mountain. It was about seven miles round trip and I had to hike in. I loved it, getting up before the weekend warrior crowd, and hiking in as the sun rose. I lasted two years at that job before I found another one close by. Less Taurus and more time in nature sounded perfect to me. I didn't have to warn families about the dangers of trying to pet bison anymore. I would be working for the Black Hills National Forest. Not quite the start of the Rockies yet, but I was moving in that direction. I was thrilled to be working there. I loved to be out in nature and seeing all sorts of wildlife. There was a lot of trail and road maintenance to be done my first summer. They were also working on a program monitoring populations of several wildlife species. So I was scheduled to be working outdoors in one way or another for practically the entire season. One task I had been working on was rerouting an access road and part of a hiking trail around an area that had been washed out by some unusually heavy rains. It was a big undertaking, so we had been working in teams to get it done by the end of the fall season. Normally, the teams consisted of four or five people at a time. But sometimes we were stuck working with just one or two others, depending on the other needs in the area. Things were going well with the project. So I was able to take a small vacation, four days hiking in the Rockies in Wyoming. The day I drove home from my trip, I swung by the forest. There were still at least an hour of daylight left, and I was curious to see how far the rest of the crew got on the project. I don't know why, I just didn't wait until morning when I came into work. I should have waited until morning. I went down the old access road, and it looked like they had taken down several more trees to make a larger parking area. I saw something move in the underbrush at the edge of the forest. I stopped my car and turned the radio down. It looked like something large, maybe an elk or a bear. I couldn't quite tell. The sun was setting quickly. I thought I had more time than that, but night comes early in the mountains and has a hard time getting through the trees if you're in the woods. I waited in my car to see if I could get a better look at the animal. I knew if I got out, I would likely scare it away. Out of nowhere, I heard a loud crash and a tree topple over right next to my car. It was insane. The whole car shook when it fell. I couldn't believe the odds or how lucky I was that it didn't crush me. I got out of the car and took a look at the fallen tree. It looked healthy, no signs of decay. It didn't come up at the roots, but rather looked like it just broke off and fell. See, the whole thing was strange, but I was tired from my trip and just wanted to get back home. I was about to get back into my car when I heard another tree break apart and fall. It landed just a few feet away from the previous one. At this point, I didn't know what was going on. If a third tree fell, it would probably land right on me. I knew I had to get out of there. I had to turn the car around and maneuver around the fallen trees. And then I saw it standing there in the forest. 
The creature was knocking down the trees. I saw its eyes shine in my headlights. They were gold. I would guess it had to stand between eight or nine feet tall. Its whole body was covered in hair. Blank an ape or some similar animal. Saying it looked like Bigfoot or Sasquatch makes me sound like a crazy person. But that's really the only thing that it could have been. I don't know what else out there looks like that. It definitely wasn't a bear. It had these human hands and just thick hair all over its body. I didn't stick around long after that. It started shaking another tree. And I drove out of there. There were three trees down when the team got there for work the next day. I ended up telling my co-workers about this, but they just thought I was crazy. I live in Alberta, Canada. This story takes place back in June of 2015. I was 20, eight years old, and my fiance was 32. I will call him Kay for this story. It was going to be a very hot day, for we had just purchased our first car after years of taking public transit and decided to go for an overnight trip to Jasper Park. To anyone who does not know, Jasper Park is a beautiful stretch of highway that runs through the foothills into the Rockies right around where. I'm not sure what it is like in other countries, but here in the parks and wooded areas, it is not uncommon for people to pull off on the side of the highway and hike into areas for day trips or even to camp to avoid the overcrowded campgrounds. We had been on the road for about four hours and I was starting to feel cramped when we came to an area with a beautiful glacier river running next to the highway. So we decided to pull off the road onto an old maintenance road that ran down to what we thought was the train tracks that ran parallel to the road. The road was extremely overgrown and had railroad ties sticking up vertically about two feet out of the ground in an attempt to block the road permanently, but they were spaced apart enough for a very small vehicle to get through. Well, our new car happened to be one of those tiny economy class cars, so we decided to try and fit past the barrier. So Kay got out and directed me through the small opening in between the posts, and to my surprise, we fit. He decided it would be best for him to walk in front of me and lead me through the overgrown path while I crept the car forward in case there were any rocks or stumps that could damage the very low undercarriage of our new car. After about 15 feet into the road, the grass suddenly became taller than my car, and the trees thick and brushing against the roof, and the path was dark with light at the end that indicated a clearing. Basically, it looked like something out of one of those really corny camping horror movies. But we decided to go forward and came upon in clear-cut land. These lines are cut out by the government as survey and gas lines. Anyways, we went about 50 feet into the clearing that was surrounded by thick trees on all sides. After finding a flattish area where we could set up a makeshift camp, Kay decided to go and try and find where the river ran closest so we could go stick our feet in and cool down. I voiced concern about the bears in the area and wanted to keep the bear spray with me. So he took his wood axe with him. Side note, people do not have guns other than hunting rifles due to our gun laws. And due to this, we did not have anything other than bear spray, pocket knives, and an axe for potential defense. I decided to start digging out our tent to look for a spot to set it up for the night. Kay was in gone for about five minutes when I heard what looked like another vehicle close by. I did not think anything of it at the time, thinking who else could possibly fit their car through there. So I brushed it off and continued what I was doing, but at the same time moved my can of bear spray out of the backpack to just inside the, of my trunk, where I could grab it in a matter of seconds. Just in case, right. After another minute or so, I just happened to look in the direction of road that led us into the clearing. And to my surprise, I see a man walking towards me. He looked about 35, 40 years old, with a ball cap and dirty blue reflective coveralls on. You know the ones you see the oil rig guys wear. After the complete shock of seeing someone, I started to notice. I could not see his face that well, but he had on a ball cap and shades with a scruffy beard. He was walking directly towards me with his hands in his pockets. 
I started to panic a little and immediately called out for Kay and for him to get back here. I hear him yell something, but I refuse to take my eyes off the stranger who is now less than 20 feet away from me. Now I should mention that the area is no for hunting, but it was not the season. He reaches me and stops about five feet away, and me being the friendly person I am, I smile and say hi. Did not expect to see anyone here. He looks at me from head to toe and stands there for what feels like forever, and then says, um, hello, what brings you here? His tone very blank and not giving anything away. I say my fiancé and I were just looking for a place to pop the tent for the night. He freezes at the mention of my fiancé. He looks around as he hears Key coming through the woods to the right of us. The stranger, still gawking at me, does not move as Key comes out of the tree line with his axe propped up on his shoulder. Key looks at me and then the stranger and immediately speed walks to my side and being the cautious, overly protective guy, he just says, hey man, is there something I can help you with? No, was just checking my trail cams. The guy then looks at Kay, assessing him and glaring at his axe. I ask him, oh, so you know the area. Do you know if it's okay for us to camp here for the night? He looks directly at me and says, yeah, as long as you do not have a fire or anything, and once in a while service trucks come down here to survey. Me, thanks for the heads up. I smile. He will not stop looking at me at this point. Kay sees this and decides he has had enough, and says again, is there something you needed? The guy finally stops looking at me long enough to answer. I was in here checking my trail cams and got a flat on my Jeep. He indicates the bumper of his Jeep that is just visible through the brush. He continues, I tried to change to my spare, but I have custom wheels and cannot get the nuts off with the tools I have. Now everyone in Alberta knows that guys with custom trucks are go off. Roading always carry the proper tools, alarm on and Kay and I walk closer to get a better view of his vehicle and note that it is one of those jacked up off-road jeeps with the engine snorkel and everything. I remember the alarms going off in my head, yelling at me that this is weird. Even I carry the tools needed to switch out my tires. At this point, I notice his jeep is blocking the only entrance into the clearing. I proceed to say, um... Sorry, but as you can tell, I only have a small car, and my tire iron is only big enough to fit the nuts for my 15 wheels on my car. I don't think we will be able to help you. The guy starts to look annoyed as Kay and I start to move back to our car. The guy follows us back to our car, then says, well, could she possibly give me a lift to Jasper to get help? I immediately start to panic and say, well, my car is packed to roof with our camping gear. I am one of those overpackers that has something for every situation. I am not unloading all my stuff and leaving it here in the woods. The guy starts to get agitated, shifting back and forth in place. He then says it would only be a couple hours and your finest can stay here with your stuff then. I am about to say no when Kay says very plainly I am not letting her drive alone with you and leave me here in the woods. The guy looks at Kay and says please. I just need a ride into town, or at least to somewhere where I can get cell reception. Note, there is no reception in most of Jasper Park unless you have a booster or satellite phone. Even then, it's patchy service. And the closest town is Jasper itself, which at this point was two hours away. He continues to try and get me to drive him by myself for another five minutes before we both get visibly irritated. Kay then says as calmly as he can, sorry, man, you're going to have to walk out to the road and hail someone down. Now the guy is mad and takes one last look at me and then turns around and walks towards the road. After he is out of sight, Kay and I immediately pack up the car and start to turn around and head for the clearing entrance. As we pull up to where his jeep is blocking the access to the road, both Kay and I get out and investigate his jeep. He did not have a flat. There was nothing wrong with his Jeep at all. Kay decides to look in the back seat through the tinted windows. He all of a sudden panics and says we need to get out of here. I do not question him and get in the driver's seat while Kay takes his axe and clears away the brush on the side of where his Jeep is blocking the exit. After about ten minutes of pulling weeds, branched, and rocks, we make a space big enough to creep through. 
It takes us an additional five minutes to creep through the overgrown access back out to the highway. As we are pulling up onto the highway, we can see the creep down a ways hitchhiking. Key says just drive in the opposite direction. So we drive for about 15 minutes and decide to double back and see if he was still there. As we come up to access again, we notice he is no longer on the side of the road. So we pull into the access road again where the makeshift barrier was and immediately notice his Jeep is gone. Creaks out and we back out of there and drive 40. Five minutes up the highway to a new spot. We find a nice calm area directly next to the highway where we can access the river. We hang out for a couple hours while all the time keeping an eye out for the creepy guy. We kept hearing twigs snapping behind us in the overgrowth, but due to the events that day decided to err on the side of caution and not go investigate. I finally start to relax a little bit and just enjoy the sweltering heat. Around 6 p.m. it was starting to get dark because of the mountains blocking the sun so Kay decides it's time to pack up and leave. I remind him that I had a couple beers while sitting at the river so I needed to nap before we could go anywhere. He agrees and we go and sit in the car which we had parked on a little makeshift rest area. We hunker down and I try to doze off. Suddenly Kay jerks up and says, did you hear that? I still somewhat groggy from just passing out know what's going on, Kay, quiet. By this time, it is pitch black all around us. All of a sudden, I hear it, the crunch of gravel and twigs, as if someone is walking in wide circles around us. We look at each other and then hear it again, this time closer and to the front of the car. I squint as hard as I can and then immediately turn the key and turn on the lights. To our surprise, there is no one there. Without saying anything, I decided I had rested enough and my adrenaline was coursing through me. I turned the engine over and threw the car into reverse and headed back down the highway towards home. After about 20 minutes of nerve-wrenching silence and constantly checking our mirrors to see if anyone was following us, I break the silence and ask the question that has been bugging me. So now that we are out of there, what was in the back seat of his Jeep that made you freak out so bad... Kay looks at me, worry etched on his face. Not normal for him at all. Takes a deep breath and says it was hard to see due to the tent. But I could make out a hunting rifle, which is not out of the ordinary here. But most disturbing was a roll of duct tape, rope, and a tarp. After seeing that Kay freaked out, realizing this guy wanted more than just a ride from me. I know this may not be scary to most people, but to me, this was one of two terrifying events in my life. This has not stopped us from going and enjoying the beauty of nature in the Canadian Rockies, but to the creepy guy who lied about his flat tire to try and get me alone in the middle of nowhere. Let us never meet again. I've always been skeptical on the paranormal, but this event rattled me. I can tell what's going on around me when people are nearby even though I cannot see them. It's weird, I guess it's a sixth sense, and it can be a gift and curse. A couple months ago, I was living life normally, and I have never had any problems with sleeping. I am borderline narcoleptic because it seemed like I could never get enough sleep and always wanted to sleep. I'm a pretty deep sleeper as well, so yet again, I don't have trouble sleeping. Next to my bed, I have a jacket rack. It has about one jacket on it in this decoration. The decoration on the jacket rack is an aluminum cartoon-like dress. The dress is too, by the way. If you grab the dress and bang it up against the post of the jacket hanger, it makes a very distinct noise. I am quite paranoid and jumpy a lot, so having the side my head lays against the wall doesn't help because I'm exposed from both left and right. On the right is the jacket hanger. On the other side is my nightstand. The wall is slanted because my room must have been a storage room or something like that. There is a window area along the wall that is carved out and bulged from the outside. My large pillows laid in that caved out area since my bed had them for decoration when it's made up. So normally I go to bed and sleep at around 10 p.m. I is. I'm not sure when it was that night at about 4 a.m. 
or so I hear what sound like a soda can rattling as if you were clinking the bottom in a circular wrist motion on a wood surface. It was weird because the sound sounded like it was coming from behind the nightstand, nearly behind the tiny gap between my bed and the wall. Something to mention as I was collecting Sprite cans to make something with them. I was facing the jacket hanger. I thought the can was part of my dream, but that thought quickly went away. Not long after the sound of the aluminum dress started to join in on whatever strange harmony the can was doing. Now the dress only bangs when my ceiling fans are both on high. Even then, it is super light. That night I had one fan on low, the other off. The fan that was on was far away from me, so it couldn't even touch the dress. To make it worse, it wasn't even light clinking like normal. It sounded like full-on aggressive banging. I thought for a minute which made me freeze in absolute fear. Another thing to note, it had been almost a year since I had broke up with my psycho ex. We had dated online. Yes, I know sad. In the two years we dated, we had met in person four times since we lived two hours away. Two of the times we met, it was at my house. We are both minors and can't drive. When I broke up with him in January 2020, he had a horrible mental breakdown. It did not make it better when I got with my crush, one of his best friends. I felt so happy with my new boyfriend, I still am, and we are still dating. I wanted to feel bad, but he was so abusive and would threaten self-harm. I tend to try to be friends with my exes because all of them had been good friends before, so usually I stayed neutral. After a while in March, he contacted me and we caught up. He confessed that he was so mad he wanted to kidnap me to keep me all to himself. I was kind of scared, but brushed it off. I don't remember how, but we became enemies again. I was uneasy for a while after because of what he said. Because of this incident, that was the first thing I thought of. I just thought, well, today's the day. Because I wasn't scared to fight, but it still shook me up. My blood ran cold, and the banging and clanking started to become deafening. Eventually, I got uncomfortable and turned over very stiffly and slowly. As soon as I went to shut my eyes, I saw something. I opened my eyes, and in the carve-out where the pillows were was a figure. I had to do a double-take, more like closing my eyes hard and opening them wide again. With my elbow propping up my half-laying-down body, my heart simultaneously sank and stopped at the sight. It felt like I couldn't breathe. I slowly ended up lowering my body back down on my side. The figure had half a body cutting off above the hips. The figure was wearing a black tux and black button, up or so, I thought, because of the darkness. The arms were in a position as if to adjust a bow tie. The head was the oddest of all. It was shaped like a plague doctor's mask. But the back was more pointed, and overall, the head looked like a right triangle or a skyline triangle. The head didn't have barely any definition of facial features, just some depth like the plague doctor masks you see everywhere. But like I said, the shape was way different. It had no eyes, no mouth, no mouth, no mouth, nothing. It looked like Pyramid's little skinny cousin. It started moving its head like it was analyzing my room, trying to figure out its surroundings. The arms were slightly moving as like a Disney animatronic in a nearly static pose, but barely moving. The noise completely subsided almost instantly after I saw it. I keep trying to focus on the creature to see if it could be the pillows making a shape. My eyes seem to never get used to the darkness. I subconsciously start crying silently, frozen in absolute terror. I felt like if I were to make a noise, breathe, or move, this thing would lunge at me. Eventually, me and this thing had a long staring contest. It felt like I couldn't blink, and if I did, it would be gone. It felt like forever before I could muster up enough courage to quickly snatch my phone, turn on flash, and it was gone. I sighed, and it felt like I hadn't breathed that whole time. I was basically shaking in fear. It was 5 a.m., and I just started playing on my phone because that was crazy. I just don't get it. I've never had sleep paralysis ever, and never really had nightmares.
It also couldn't be me being asleep or half asleep, because the second I saw it, my heart started to race and my body filled with adrenaline. After that time, I haven't seen it, but I think about from time to time. Which doesn't make sense if it was a dream, because I usually don't dream either. And when I do, I can rarely remember it. I will gladly answer any questions and will appreciate on any explanation possible on what it was. This happened back in either 2000 or 2001. I can't really remember which, but it was around there so quite a while ago. I have a group of friends that loves the outdoors and loves to explore different areas around the country. We've been all over from east coast to west, north and south. It's been a lot of fun over the years. I prefer the north as I'm not a fan of being hot and sweaty, but we vote on where we're going next. So we got the group together and half chose to go to Big Cypress National Preserve in Florida. I wanted to go to Alaska, but it was only me and my buddy John who chose Alaska, unfortunately. I agreed on Florida on the condition we didn't go in the summer, which was debated for about an hour over lunch. Finally, I convinced enough of my friends that it was a good idea. We compromised on going in September, where it's still warm but not excruciatingly hot like in the middle of summer. We planned on hiking, biking, canoeing, and staying at multiple campsites throughout the park. We'd even planned to try some of the primitive sites without all the modern creature comforts. We decided we'd check out Everglades National Park as well since it's right next door to Big Cypress. We drove east down the main road called the Tamiami Trail to the scenic route that brought us to the Concho Billy Trail. Finally, we get to the trail park, the cars, and get our bikes out. We all took pictures of the Green Concho Trail sign. And that's when we first smelled something rank, kind of skunk-like. That's not unusual, though out in nature, and we set out on the trail. The smell passed pretty quickly, about ten minutes into our ride. We stopped again after about a mile and heard this loud call from the trees. It was low, almost a rumble, but it carried. We all just looked at each other and put our fingers up to our lips. I know there's no mountain lions in the park, but I wasn't sure if there was a bear or not. Twice we heard it call out, and my friend Annie even recorded it on her phone. We waited after the second call about 20 minutes. Then we got back on our bikes and took off. We traveled barely half a mile more when we heard the call again. We stopped to listen, and then we smelled an awful rank smell again. This time, it was like a mix of skunk and strong urine. That's the best I can describe it. The call seemed farther out than we'd heard before, but the smell seemed to just permeate the entire area. It was incredibly strong, and he decided to record the sounds again with her phone. We stayed there maybe ten minutes, and something crashed in the trees off to our right, maybe thirty feet away from us. We didn't stay to see what it was. We got on our bikes, and we hauled as fast as we could back to the cars. I don't know what it was. We got back in the cars and took off back to camp. We were all laughing at each other and kind of freaking out together. We got back to camp, and we told our story to a few people, even played the recording. No one knew what it was, but we did learn that there is indeed black bear that live in the preserve. What we heard wasn't a bear, though and that smell seemed to show up with the calls. We've had odd encounters before in our travels, but this one, this one, takes the cake. To this day, no one knows what we heard. We've played the calls to many people, even some animal people. You know, hunters and some rangers, we've met it in our travels. No one can identify the calls. It's really strange. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.